Hi. Uh, for the beginning, I want to say that this presentation will be about clean architecture, which for me is really, really exciting. And I think that Uncle Bob's book about clean architecture is also so exciting. It's like a criminal book for me. I'm a nerd, yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's begin. Mm. Okay. It doesn't work. Okay, my name is Grzegorz Kocjan, and I'm from Poland. If you find my name difficult to pronounce, I'm from the city of Łódź, have a luck. Uh, but for simplification, make life easier, you can call me Greg. Um, eight years of programming in Python is a great adventure for me, and I'm really happy that I met Python as a first commercial programming language for me. Currently, I'm working at HDT, <laughs> And I share my free time in by creating local IT community, Migavka IT, and dancing modern dress with my wife. My goal is to keep commonplace stuff to a minimum uh, while sharing as much as of my experience as possible. That's a lot of slides, so I will try to be as painless as possible. Now, you're going to see this symbol from time to time. I use it to mark the parts I think are most important, that are most important for me. So when you see it, just wake up for a second. For a little warm up, we'll begin with what's new in Python. Anyone using type annotations? Yeah, I love those hands. Okay, great. So for the uninitiated, uh, Python annotations were introduced in Python 3.5. Initially, they only worked in function declaration. Here you can see that we have our input parameter, integer, and return type dictionary. But let's take a closer look to that return type. Using dictionary type, uh, we can ensure that we won't call an incorrect function uh, or an incorrect method on the return value. But what does that say us to, for, to us from the business point of view? Frankly, nothing. We have no knowledge what to accept from this dictionary. And this is my pro tip number one. With typing, be precise, not use too general type annotations. How? For example, with aliases. If you have been in previous talks about typings, wait a second. <laughs> uh, here you can see order alias, which is a dictionary of string key and string or integer values. Mm. And we can use it as a return type of our function. <laughs> While we gain your ability, what is most important for me that we know what is inside this dictionary. An order. From Python 3.6 onwards, we gain possibility to annotate uh, variables. So we can say that our order name for EuroPython is a string type. Also, we can use our type annotations aliases to annotate order. As you can see, it is still a simple dictionary initialization. Nothing changed, only the type is set. And this is how fully typed function in Python 3.6 looks like. However, this sole function definition tells us nothing about the fields inside this order. We need to investigate the function body to find out that it has ID and name fields. How do we bypass that? With Python 3.7, which places the cherry on the cake for typings. Do you know what is it? Data classes. Data classes, as name implies, are classes designed for storing data. We only need to define what to store in them, nothing more. We don't need to define init functions. We don't need to define string representations. That's all you need. And we can use, instead, our alias dictionary, this data class as our return type and to create order variable inside this function. And this is pro tip number two. Data classes work very well with type annotations. Now we are super precise what we are doing. There is no chance that by accident someone will forget a required field. And this is terrible. 
This now is fully automatically type checked and verified. Okay, that was that commonplace stuff that I want to keep to a minimum. Now let's talk architecture. Let's begin with the big question, how to design architecture. With the idea of maintaining it for the next 10 years. This is really important because usually we change our job every few years and we forget that those applications will be still developed by other people. And keeping that in mind is important because maybe, just maybe, we'll get lucky and those karma came back up to us. So how to achieve that? With clean architecture. Clean architecture puts the application domain in the center of our application, not the database. It considers a database a part of the outside world. So what is application domain? It is where we implement our business logic and how we want to communicate with this outside world. Nothing more. So let's see how to do that. It's time for coding. We create a simple microservice with three responsibilities, three use cases. Create order, view order list, and last not but least, our most important feature, feature cash cow, adding existing item to order. I'd like you to show the code that I, will, that I prepared for the demo you will see later. And this code is based on real production application. And those are steps that I take to prepare this code. We'll begin with data definition or entities, which is data that we'll be working on. First, we implement base entity, which is not much, as you can see, but when we create our first real entity, data mm, class client, it will inherit from our base entity. But there is a small difference between the earlier data classes and this one. Here, we add frozen equals true parameter. What does that do? For instance, if we create me, Grzegorz, and someone will try to say, hey Grzegorz, now your name is Alice, Python will protect me and say, frozen instance error, no. So this is called immutability. An instance once created cannot be modified. And is it difficult, oh sorry. And is it difficult to use uh, frozen data classes? No. Is it, dif uh, it will be useful in our demo? Also not. So why? Well, because immutability can be handy when our project gets bigger and bigger and we want to add multi-processing uh, multi or threading, so concurrency, then immutability solves a lot of problems. And for now, it is important for you to remember that adding immutability to existing code base is really difficult. It is far easier to start it from the beginning. Okay, but let's go back to our entities. We can add product definition, also a frozen data class. And the most complex one, order. ID created client. As you can see, we can use our other uh, data classes as our type. Total cost, here you can see how to define default value. And <coughs> items. What can we say about our items without type? Not much. Usually we need to dig through the code to find where and how it is initialized to find out it is a list or a dictionary or some other class instance and what methods we can run on it. But by having well-defined types like this one, we know for sure that it is a list of product class instances. And if you want to set, if you want, uh, to set an empty list as a default value, we need to use field default factory, like this one. Okay, that's all about entities. Let's move on. We'll implement some business logic called use cases. Our order logic class has three methods, three use cases. Create order for client ID and return order instance. 
search for client orders and return them in a list. And finally, our most important feature that earns us money, add product to order and return updated order instance. But those are operations on a database, so should we start using database? It's a time to introduce, any guesses? No, an abstraction. And this is pro tip number three. Each time you have to communicate with outside world, like database, use an abstraction for that. As you can see, between our application and database, we have an adapter, and inside domain, as I mentioned at, at the beginning, we can define only how it should look like. Nothing more, everything else is outside. So in programming, we create application inter, uh, interfaces, mm, sorry, abstraction we create by creating interfaces, like this one. So we have a class, iClient repository, where i stands for interface, with two methods, create and get, and both of them returns client data class. To mark them as interfaces in Python, we use ABC package, which is a part of the standard library. And interface does nothing. So those function bodies are empty. In exactly the same, we implement, prepare our iProduct repository. And of course, at the end, our order repository, create, get, and for the first time, save. We want to store some data. And search with optional argument client. As you can see, we must strictly mark that our client's argument is optional. Only by doing so, we can pass non-values to it. And we are returning, of course, a list of orders that was found. OK, we define how we want to communicate with this outside world. Um, now, uh, we can go back to our logic, order logic class. We need to pass all those interfaces in our init function. So we can use them later. But to, mark, to make our life easier, I use inject decorator, which is a part of injector package that does that for us. This is pro tip number four. When we add an abstraction to our project, it is good to be able to manage it somehow. This is the injector. For this injector, use dependency injector, injection, well known in type word. And by using it, we can configure how we want our instances, interfaces to be created. Mm, so we don't need to do that manually each time. Injector will do that for us. So each time you want to create order logic instance, Injector will pass all those arguments. And this is a quite simple example with only three interfaces, but imagine what, will hap what would happen if we will have over a dozen of those interfaces. Creating all of the, your instances, managing them manually would be a terrible, 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 and believe me, you don't want to be in that place. Okay, so we have our interfaces, we can now implement our first method, search. First, we get a client from client repository, and then we use it in orders repository to search. And that's it, search is ready. Create, with create we do the same, get client object, and search by client, in, uh, and, and uh, create an order uh, in order repository. And as usual, at the end, our most important ad product, we get an order, uh, we get an order and product from these repositories, and we want to add product to an order. But what's that strange construction here? As you remember, we marked our data classes as frozen. So we cannot modify them, but we can replace them. And we can do that with replace function. First argument is our old instance. 
And in quarks, we pass only those arguments that we want to replace. In our case, we are adding new item and increasing total cost. And of course, at the end, we want to use save to our new replaced order. Okay, we did a lot of work, wrote a lot of code, added abstractions, we use a dependency injections, strange things in Python, and all of that just to add single item to an order. Why bother? Why do that things? Let's write some unit tests to find out. We have our test named test at product increases total cost, and this is pro tip number five. Use expressive names of tests. Write them in a way that after reading all of them, they will create a story. A story comprehensible for newbies and ignorance. There are many benefits of doing so. Uh, we are forced to create smaller tests. We can see where we made mistakes by only looking at failed test report and we create a living documentation of our application. <coughs> and to add product, we need our interfaces. So using PyTest, I create a fixture that returns static repositories. And they are returning always the same object. As you can see, the return type of this tuple um, are uh, those repositories and I use alias for it. And passing this terrible tuple to 20 or even more tests would be a terrible idea. You will start hating typing if you will do so. So aliases are made for such situations when we have such complicated tuples that we want to return or other complex objects. Mm. And this is my pro tip number six. Aliases really works here well. Okay, but let's go ahead and write this test already. I personally hated writing tests uh, when I have to write 300 lines of code just to test three or five real code uh, of our application, of my application. It was a terrible nightmare. And if you had someone says that he hates uh, unit testing, it is probably because he never see a test like this one. Bam, three lines of code. That's all you need when you do clean architecture the right way. First, initialize logic. Second, call the logic. And third, validate the result. You need a bunch of those to cover all corner cases of your application and other use cases. This is really, really easy and really nice to write. Okay, our cases are written and well tested. So now we need to implement our interfaces. We need to work on data. So is it already the time for a database? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's time for a repository in, wait for it, memory. Now we will literally prepare our own database implementation. Sounds easy? We'll do that in a single class named RAM storage. It has internal storage type, which is a simple uh, dictionary. Here you can see some strange typing construction. When I first seen that, my head went kaboom. And so let's go step by step to figure out what is going on. First, we declare t, which is a type variable, so we can put some variable in place of t. Then we create storage type with integer keys and t values. And finally, we inherit in our RAM storage from generic t. What does that mean? When we create an instance of RAM storage like this one, we'll replace all t in the first instance with client type and for the second instance with order. So for the first insight, inside this internal RAM storage, we can only put variables of client type. We cannot mix them. This, gas, this gives us a great control over what we are storing in our simple database. 
And to be honest, that was the scariest part of this talk, so I'm happy that you are still with me. In our database, we want to implement such methods. Add, add an item to dictionary. You know how to do that, right? Get, get an item from a dictionary for a given key. Search, filter dictionary values. Remove, remove an item from the dictionary. All, return all values in form of a list. And that's, need, and that's all you need to create our own database implementation in Python. Basic dictionary operations. So now using this simple storage, we can implement our repositories. Let's, let's start with product repository. We have internal RAM storage. Of course, we mark them as product types. And inside get, we just call RAM storage get, get and check if the result exists. If it does, return value. If not, price product not found exception. That's how we can implement all of our repositories. Mm, but as you can see, it is quite boring, so we will skip that part. But I will provide you the link for the GitHub repository so we can preview all of this later. OK, interfaces, check. Now we will expose our business logic to the world. We will prepare an API. And for this, we can choose our framework. And this is slide number 77 and pro tip number seven, originally, not now. And the pro tip is don't choose your framework at the very beginning. Now we know how our application looks like. We know our use cases, we know how we implement them, and we can make an informed decision of what framework to choose. My decision was Flask and Connection. You're probably familiar with Flask, so let's go take a closer look at Connection. With Connection, you can use a YAM file to describe how your API will look like. Here, you have order search, which is a get method, and it will be handled by operation ID, our package, and point search. Of course, we can have more description in here, like input parameters, <laughs> response template, and by doing all of that, we can preview our API in a form of a nice UI, like this one. In connection, we define how our API will look like. Now, I will show you the whole implementation of our endpoints in one slide. I only skip, skipped the imports, nothing more. OK, search. First argument, logic. Second, client ID. We want to return list in the order. Return, logi logic, search, client ID equals client ID. That's all. Create. First argument again, logic. Here we have second argument, body. This is how you received put and post body JSON data. And body, logic, create client ID equals body client ID. Again, that's it. And finally, at product, again, argument and return logic at product order ID, product ID. This is the whole implementation of that connects API with our business logic. Uh, those more familiar with Flask probably wonder where this logic <coughs> come from, this order logic type, because usually in endpoints we received arguments that are passed from request. Well, this argument is injected by injector. To make our life easier, I use additional small package called Flask injector. It wraps all of our endpoint functions We've inject the decorator so we don't need to do that manually. To configure it, we need to pass our application and modules. Modules are a, a list of configurations of injections. To configure such uh, configuration of injections, we need to inherit from modules uh, from injector module and override configure method. Inside it, we use binder to bind order logic to order logic. That's an easy case, so let's take a closer look to a more complex one. Hey, injector, each time 
I ask for iClient repository. Please kindly give me an instance of client repository. And of course, this is our implementation in memory, so we want to share the state. So we say the binder set the scope to singleton, so the instance will be created only once. And that's it. The second freaky, th uh, freaky thing uh, is return type of each function. In Flask, we need to return data that is serializable. <laughs> serializ serializable. Dictionaries, strings, integers, simple types. Order data classes are not serializable. So how does it work? We do response serialization automatically. Generally, we can do that by inheriting from JSON encoder. And usually, we are using that for saying that our date time instances or date instances should be converted to nice ISO format. So we can do the same with our data classes. For example, client. Each time um, we receive our client object, we'll convert it to the nice dictionary. Of course, doing such thing for all of our entities in production application will be terrible. So we can do that in a smart way, only once. Do you remember all of our entities inherits from base entity class that does nothing? But we can use it now and cut out our, our, all of our entities in one place and convert them easily. Okay, at the end we need to also remember to uh, call the default implementation because serializer, serializers are called recursively. Okay, that's all about API. When we go back to this picture, there is still um, one piece missing, borders. Each color change is a border, a border that needs to be protected. We run tests to check if our code works. We run black to check if our code, code looks good. And we also make do something to protect our borders. And this is pro tip number eight, do it. How? We can protect our borders by creating project structure that supports that. Here, our domain, logic, and interfaces are in the shop directory. Interface implementation and RAM storage is in RAMDB. And finally, Flask in API. But that's not enough. We can easily import from RAMDB or API in our shop, in our application domain. So we can go one step further and create a package for each of those directories. Now we have separate.py and what's most important, separate requirements. We can call them micro -lips. So. Now we have 100% sure that no one will import the Flask or RAMDB inside of our shop, inside of our domain. Of course, we can still add something to our requirements, but adding, <coughs> modifying requirements should be always considered as dangerous. So we usually keep, uh, pay more attention to that. But installing so many microlips in dev environment can be painful, so that's why we can create generic setup.py that can install them for us automatically. And I will not show you that, but you can also preview that in the GitHub repo. It is also, a, there will be also a link for article where you can find how it was invented. Okay, it is far, time for live demo. I hope it will go okay. Mm. Small change. Okay, this is our Swagger UI that you've seen before. Here, like a real backend developers, we can click and see how our response was defined. And we can set client ID, click tryout, 
and see that our URL was executed and we have response body. We can see that Guido is one of our customers and he has one order with no items and total cost zero. So now we can add some product to his order. We have order ID one, product ID one, tryout, and bam, Guido, Guido has now a phone, we can call to him. Also total cost was updated as accepted. And when we go back to our get and call it again, we see that this order is updated also here. So we can try to add another product, product ID two, and we can see that we have also bought a nice new graphic card, which is quite expensive. But what's most important that total cost has increased and simple math in our project works. That's great. But what will happen when we try to break something like real good testers? Let's try something like this. Hmm. Response code 400, nice JSON message, product not found, element not found. How does that happen? As I promised, I was showing you all the code. As you can see, here are endpoints. Only imports were missing, but here is everything like in slides. When we go to our add product logic, it is also look familiar. Injector, init function, add product. But when we go deeper in product to product interface, one thing becomes apparent the return typed. Thanks to spending some time on designing this architecture, I designed that all of those interfaces must always return an entity. So inside the implementation, if our product is not found, we write product not found exception. You, see, you saw that on the slides. So how to convert this exception to nice JSON message. So we need to go to the, our mine file where we define and configure our Flask API, our Flask API. Here you can find the connection. We are adding this YAM file that describes how our API look like. Here we configure Flask injector and JSON encoder. But one thing is new. Here you can see error handler. Error handler that, that checks if one of our endpoints doesn't end with element not found exception. And if it does, it converts it to nice connection problem object that renders this nice JSON message. So that's it. The application is works. What are benefits? First of all, business logic independence. Hmm. Well, we don't care probably about that, but this implies a very important thing to us. is of technology update and change. And this one gives us the power to maintain our application over the next 10 years. We can easily update our framework, we can easily change our database. As you can see, we don't even have a database and it works. So we don't need it. We can change it, we can update it. We can do everything we want with our technology clear and secure borders, and that gives us the power to maintain our ease of technology update. Technology chosen based on knowledge. As I mentioned, we choose our framework at very end, and we make conscious decision <coughs> of what framework to choose. Fast prototyping and proof of concept. I was creating this for like the second time, this, up, this such kind of application, and it took me like two hours only to prepare this demo, and it works. We can test it, we can pr prepare front end for it. And what is most important, we cannot send it to production because if we run it in production and restart it, it all be gone. Because as you can see, we have running the bugger here. If we restart application, oof, works, and we refresh, and it doesn't work, oh, work. Client ID, tryout, nothing. The state was restarted. 
so we cannot pr deploy this to production. Ease of testing. You see three lines of code. And we're only installing the required packages. So this is important, for example, when we have workers, we have API, and we don't want our API to be installed on worker Docker image or our worker uh, libraries in our API. We can split them easily. And to sum up, for me, architecture is a set of conscious deci decisions. And a clean architecture is a way to import, to <laughs> delay those important decisions. Further reading. Uh, if you want to learn more about clean architecture, there's a great book by Robert C. Martin, Clean Architecture. And there is a microlib article on Medium that inspired us to create borders with uh, with Python, and I have one question for you. Can I make some selfie with you? That's okay. Okay. Make a smile. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's it from me. Uh, one more thing. If you have any suggestions, want to ask me some question privately, you can mail me, you can tweet me. I really will respond. And please give me a feedback. It is really helpful for the next presentation. And here is this, the link for the PDF with slides and also the code. OK, thanks. Thank you, Greg. Do you have questions? So you say um, you start with the with the model in the, in the Python code, and uh, and then you choose your framework. Do you think um, Django will <laughs> kind of go that way and integrate that um, into its language? And I mean, after all, one day Python 3.6 will be obsolete. And then we can focus on 3.7 and do the same thing here. And we have the choice. I mean, we can go directly with Django. And OK, it's nice to have Flask in the end. But yeah, what I mean, could be the same solution with Django right away. Do you uh, think that will happen? So two answers. First of all, uh, I don't start with model. It is really important to remember that entities are dif totally different thing than model. Uh, for example, we had one entity that was saved in two different databases. So we have one table and one some kind of data table that were used to store only one single uh, entity. So entities are not our models. It is different thing. And for the Django part, well, it is difficult to use clean architecture in Django, but it is not impossible. Well, to prepare clean architecture in Django, you need to do some conversion between objects and Django ORM models, and you need to do, the, do it uh, many times, but it is possible. But it's not very easy. Django is not well prepared for that. But we have a bunch of other frameworks, uh, not only Flask, but also, for example, new framework Fast API that looks really great and supports typing. Hello, thank you for a good talk. I have a question about the order of your designing. I would personally start from the API ones and then um, make a business. Um, any thoughts about that? Uh, can you repeat? Because I didn't hear what middle part. Ah, yeah. Uh, so uh, you started from uh, designing uh, entity types and business logic. Yes. I would personally start from an API endpoints. And if I'm not wrong, uh, this connection library can even define uh, types of input and output and validate them. 
So maybe you can skip the Python typing part. Uh, so that's why I mentioned the fast API framework because it do it nicer way. You don't need to define your YAM file to define how your API will look like. You will do that only by using type annotations. So this is a really cool feature that I like. I didn't try it yet, but when I go back home, I will do that for sure. And this will be much easier. Why I didn't start from creating an API is because it is easier to break rules of clean architecture when you start from API. It is easy to break some borders. So that's why we start from creating our business logic, because we create it only using Python and nothing more. Oh, we use injector, okay, but nothing more. And we didn't use any extra requirements for that. So there was no issue that from mistake we import some global state from Flask, et cetera. Another question? Um, is there a reason you don't put any methods on the data classes? I mean, you had this order class and then order logic, but if you just, like, I don't know, then you have product and product logic, and um, as long as that does not get too big, some small, like, like if it's only a couple of methods, do you usually put that there, or? Well, this, this, this is uh, my personal experience, why I didn't use any methods in data classes. I had a really bad, bad experience when we put a lot of logic inside our SQL alchemy models. <laughs> and it ends up really badly when we couldn't modify anything in our application. And what was worse, when we decided to move outside of uh, SQL and to use some non-SQL uh, database. So it was really painful back then. So we decided to also create this small border that we will not put uh, any logic to our models. It's because um, when we do so, it sometimes, um, we sometimes want to do some hacks and add some extra methods, extra logic to, to data classes because it's easier right now, but, but, but after uh, doing so, we can end up with very familiar with us leg leg legacy code. That's how we create legacy code, by creating more methods in our data sets. Time for a last question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hi. Uh, does uh, object not found uh, exception exists in Swagger declaration in, by connection? Uh, no, this, uh, this, you ask about this. Well, this is the exception that I wrote and all the other exceptions inherit from it. Yeah, and it is existing Swagger declaration? No, 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 no. It is, also it is in defined, I believe in, uh, yeah. This is also defined in uh, domain. So how our, uh, exceptions are, it is also the part of the, mo the domain, it is not connected to connection at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Greg. And we can proceed with the next one. Thank you. Thank you.